Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This the Committee on the Guam U.S. Military Buildup, Infrastructure and Transportation of Imina Trentai Quatru and Alias Saturan Guahan is hereby convenes this roundtable discussion on the status and updates of the Truck Enforcement Screening Station of the Guam Department of Public Works. In accordance with the open government laws, the initial notice of the roundtable was disseminated to community stakeholders and media partners on Thursday, January 25, 2018, with the second notice disseminated on Monday, January 29, 2018. Included on the agenda for discussion with community stakeholders and representatives from the Department of Public Works are the following topics. Review of cost per penalty for any violation at the test. Review of total dollar amount of penalties issued for violations as of December 2017 at the test truck enforcement station, screening station. Review of response from January 18th oversight hearing requests for Federal Highway Administration requirements of DPW and the test. And finally, the community stakeholders input since the implementation of Public Law 33-106. During discussions at the oversight hearing on January 18th, Mr. Glenn Leon Guerrero, the Director of Public Works, and Mr. Kim Bloss, Acting Highway Administrator of the Division of Highways, provided the committee information about the funding source and the estimated construction costs of the Truck Enforcement Screening Station, or the TESS. The test was funded by the Federal Highway Administration and was constructed at a cost estimated between two to three million dollars. According to Director Leon Guerrero, the test was built to help monitor the weight of trucks coming in and out of the Port Authority of Guam who traverse Guam's roads. Mr. Kim Bloss further stated the purpose of the way station was to regulate the weight placed on Guam's roads and charge fees for those in violations of those regulations. Since the construction and implementation of the Truck Enforcement Screening Station, several community stakeholders have expressed critical concerns and raised questions deserving of a response. I have requested of Director Leon Guerrero and Mr. Kim Blas to be present today to provide a status and update on the tests so that the questions and concerns of our community stakeholders are acknowledged and addressed. Before we begin with the roundtable discussion on the agenda topics, I would like to welcome and thank our community stakeholders here today, and to those of you at home, thank you for tuning in. I want to also thank DPW for joining us at this roundtable discussion, and would also like to thank my colleagues, in particular Senator Joseph Augustine, for being here this afternoon. I will now open the floor with the agenda that has been proffered and I will recognize the director, but before I do that, if I can ask and invite those in the audience who would like to join us in this roundtable discussion, if you would like to grab a seat, and please join us at the table. If any of you are gonna be providing comments or testimony this afternoon. I take it we have three additional individuals that have joined us at the, at the table. Uh, before I, I continue to proceed with the discussion and I recognize the Director of Public Works, I want to thank many of the stakeholders who are in the audience, also inclusive of those who have joined us at the table. After the Director presents his comments and his testimony on the test program, uh, I will allow for general comments to be provided from our stakeholders who have joined us at the table. At any time, to members of the audience, you feel that you would like to provide some comments or some testimony and join the conversation, you're more than welcome to either take a seat up front, and if you would prefer to remain in the audience, then we can see if we have a cordless mic that will be made available so that you can provide questions or comments. Okay, please be very mindful that the intent here is to understand the implementation of the test law the imp implications and the impact that it has had on our community, as well as the ongoing efforts by Department of Public Works in regards to uh, overall compliance with that particular legislation. Mr. Director, you're recognized. Um, 
Thank you, Senator, Senator Ogan and um, Senator St. Augustine. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, to um, uh, regret, re regret to inform you that Ken will not be able to join us. He's, um, uh, he's battling a severe bout of the flu, and I, I told him I didn't want sh him to share it, his germs with us, so I told him to stay home. Uh, and then um, I'm, I was looking, I was expecting somebody else to come in, the guy that actually runs the test facility, uh, Vincent, Leo, Vincent Guerrero, uh, he's not here yet. But when he comes in, I'd like to invite him up. To my left, I have um, Brady Nadal. He works, he's a, a project engineer, a, a lead project engineer for, for uh, WSP, uh, formerly um, uh, Parsons Rinkerhoff. And um, he'll actually do uh, a presentation. But before he actually starts, I want to say that, that, that the law that was in, enacted two years ago, um, um, I want to say, first of all, I've said this time and time again in the past, and I continue to say it, that I'm, I am truly grateful for um, the participation that we've got um, with, with the industry. We, we had several roundtables, I mean, I mean, several discussions. We've had several meetings at, in, in Adeloupe on, uh, on a monthly basis, and uh, we'll also talk about that. But um, what, what I saw and what I'm truly grateful for is I'm seeing that, that, that um, it's not just you know, it's not us against them. We're seeing this as a community effort, and I think we, if we, uh, and as we continue to uh, to view this as a community effort, uh, I'm sure we'll we'll get into some solutions that that make sense for all of us. So, and and I I'm, I certainly don't have any hard feelings. I don't. I hope they don't have any hard feelings with me. But at the end of the day, um, we'll give you a presentation which we initially started with um, Senator uh, when we shared with the the, the trucking community, and then uh, I will tell you what's happened as you as you requested. And then uh, there's some, some proposals that they, they, they generated, and we'd like to dis discuss that as well with them. So this is uh, Brady Nadal. Hello, uh, my name is Brady Nadal. I'm with WSP. I'm supporting DPW on this effort. And if we can pull up the slideshow that I've given uh, to the AV group. Thank you. Brady, if I can just ask that uh, you explain exactly what the relationship is between WSP and sure. Department of Public Works. So that the community can understand that. Sure, yes. Uh, WSP is partnered with another consulting firm, PTG, and we're program managers for DPW, um, overseeing the federal highways uh, program for them. Okay, thanks. So can we go back to the presentation agenda? So we've, I've broken up the, uh, the um, presentation into three categories, background of the test law, uh, the test law implementation, and then potential test law alternatives. Can I hit uh, to the next slide? It's not this. I have some copies. I only have 15 copies, so uh, if we run out, you're going to have to share. <laughs> Okay, this is uh, just a brief test uh, law timeline. Uh, the Guam test law was enacted in November 19th, 2015. Um, and then starting uh, basically around um, December 2016, uh, we started to have briefings with the community. Um, the citations... Brady? Yes. Um just in terms of the historical perspective, mm -hmm. so that our audience can also understand, what, what was the purpose of the test law uh, being enacted? I know that I did mention it briefly in, in my statements, but hearing it from either the director or, or yourself, okay. uh, the purpose of the test law, and then we can work from there. We sure, okay, uh, the next slide, please. So the purpose of the test law is to ensure that uh, the investment in the roads are maintained. Um, so the federal government um, enacted a code where they establish uh, weight limits um, for the roads, and, and those weight limits were then um, enacted on a state-by-state -state basis with slight variation. Um, and so, but the main purpose was to uh, 
one, regulate the weights of trucks between states and also to uh, preserve the investment in the roads that at that time the federal government and local state governments were making. Um, if you go to the next slide. Now does this, uh, Senator San Augustine, please feel free to uh, uh, chime in and pose questions along the way. But does this federal statute also apply to territories? Uh, this federal statute, uh, since it applies to interstate commerce, does not apply to territories. Um, Guam doesn't have any adjacent states, um, so it's not a requirement of Guam, but Guam still has uh, roads that need to be preserved. And okay. so. Thank you. Okay, the, the other part of um, the law is the bridge formula, and the bridge formula was um, enacted by um, the federal government in 1974, and I have a brief timeline of the history of it, um, you know, as of it evolving. And the purpose of the bridge formula was similar to the weight laws, the purpose is to preserve uh, the investment in the nation's bridges. And the bridge formula is, is a little different in that, um, Next slide, please. Oh, excuse me. Okay. Be before we go on, Senator, I just wanted to point out that in, in uh, 1970, when we had the, before the test law, this test, the proverbial test law that came in effect in, in 20, uh, 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 or two years ago, um, the gross rate was, um, gross weight, the maximum gross weight was, I think, 76,800 pounds, right? Yeah, that's correct. And then, and so the, what this did was that it, it upped the, the total max weight to 80,000. So there was some improvement. We're saying we're, we're um, but it did, it did, it did uh, increase the weight. But my point is that there was a, there was a law in the books prior that, that said that there was a max weight of 76,000, 76,800. Okay. You have uh... It's Ben Guerrero. I haven't come up because he's a former motor carrier, and I'm going to ask questions about exactly what's going on and what the difference between DRT. Because you're only you're only monitoring what's coming off the port. You, you, I can't believe that you're monitoring what's going on the roads. You only what leaves the port. That's as far as you can go. I know that. It's very evident. Well, because okay. We well, I, I need I need to know that your plan connects with DRT. Okay. Because DRT is where the motor car, and Vince knows that. He came from there. They have their own grant, and I want to make sure that it's very clear. There's no conflict. There's no, there's no uh, mixing of the, the same money. It's coming from the federal government. Okay, right. and that's what I'm concerned about. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. Um, here's just a history, some more of the, about the bridge formula, but let's go to the next slide. Okay. So here is just the um, summary of, of, the, uh, of the law weight limits. You have 80,000 pounds for gross vehicle weight. You have 20,000 pounds for single axle weight, 34,000 pounds for tandem axle weight, and then the bridge formula, which uh, the bridge formula is an equation which gives you a gross vehicle weight that's based on distance between axles and number of axles. So it's a table that gives you a variety of weights depending on the configuration of the, vehicle, of the truck. Um, and, then, and then the next slide, please. Now this is uh, reiterating, reiterating what Glenn was saying. The original Guam Tesla had a maximum gross vehicle weight of 76,800. The new Tesla has a maximum gross weight of 80,000 pounds, so a little heavier. But with bridge formula, um, depending on the configuration of the truck, you could end up with gross vehicle weights allowable that's greater than 80,000 if, if you have a truck that's, like for example, if you have a truck that's 60 feet long and eight axles, you can go up to 107,000 pounds. So, so there's more flexibility with the bridge formula. Next slide. Before you uh, continue, Mr. Nadal, I'd like to thank Senator Tom Adder, recognize him, his presence this afternoon. Uh, thank you, Senator, for joining us. Just a quick question with regards to uh, looking at the maximum gross weight allowable mm -hmm. prior to the test law and then right. subsequent to the test law. Right. So am I reading this that, in fact, there was insufficient enforcement of the prior test gross weight law? 
DPW was not in, uh, was, it was not involved in, in the enforcement. It was, as uh, Senator Sanagasin pointed out, the uh, Revin Tax uh, Motor Carrier Division that, that, that enforced. And prior to that, my understanding, and Vince can correct me if I'm wrong, but it was the, the responsibility of the uh, Guam Police Department to actually enforce the, the, the weights. No, they were, the, they, were, they were delegated initially, and then, then it pulled off of them. They went to motor carrier, and then, and then, then with this Tesla, it allows motor carrier and GPD and DPW to, to issue um, citations. Can we have uh, Vince uh, provide some comments? Sure. If, sure. Did you want to add to that statement? Uh, yes, good afternoon. So like the director said, basically, the, the way laws has always been in the books, never enforced. And from the very beginning, it was in the law, it said any police officer can enforce the weight. So uh, I'm not going to knock on GPD as to why they didn't enforce it back in the day. Uh, when Senator Ada was trying to put the law together, we, he had it where motor carrier was doing he included motor carrier to do that, but the program, motor carrier program, uh, their primary goal is not to weigh the vehicles. Their primary goal is for the safety and integrity of the vehicles. So when this test uh, situation, the test facility started to come about, what had happened was Mr. Centerada had uh, separated the responsibilities for revenue and tax, motor carrier division, the, as, as well as DPW. So now it's clearly defined in the law that when we're at the test facility, DPW will be in charge of the weights, will weigh the vehicle, and if there's any discrepancies, issue the citation. Motor carrier, if they're there at the facility, they can inspect the vehicle since it's already stopped there. So that's... And the motor carrier is there today. Yes. Uh, well, they were here. They were here. They were there yesterday. They're not here today. I believe they're doing some other stuff. We're not, we're not in the... Uh in the discussion here to be able to, to lay blame on anyone. Right. I think that the general idea is that there were some regulations and some restrictions in regards to weight on our roadways prior to the implementation of the law that was passed two yes, years ago. Yes, there was. And the issue at hand during that time is that they were not properly enforced. So now we have to look at, at the present law and, and proceed forward in terms of how we address it. So yes, thank you, Vince. Thank you. Okay, let's continue. Uh, let's bring the presentation back up. Okay, so these are the, the fines that are in the current law. Uh, there's two types of penalties. There's penalties to, for failure to stop at the test facility if you're called to stop, and these are civil penalties, and you can see that there's a list of them, $100 for the first violation, $200 for the second, $500 for the third, and 1000 for the fourth. Um, if you get a fourth violation, you're at risk of having your driver's license revoked. And these fines go to the drivers of the trucks themselves. Um, the other type of penalties are the actual weight violations in the law. And these fines go to the consignee, not to drivers. And you can see it's $500 for the first violation plus 25 cents per pound over the maximum load. And then you can see that it goes up with each violation. By the third violation, it's $1,000 um, plus 75 cents per pound over the maximum allowable load. And it, you could be eligible for a civil penalty in addition to the fines and your business license could be at risk with, with the uh, third violation. Let's go to the next slide. Um, this, is, uh, this is a slide about the test law permit. And before I talk about this, I'd like to backtrack a little bit and talk about a little bit about the timeline, um, which was the first slide. Um, so around um, October of um, 2016, uh, we started a soft rollout of, of the test facility where trucks could, um, would, were being flagged and weighed. And there were issue citations without fines just to educate them about how much they weighed. Um, and then starting around uh, December, we started regular briefings uh, starting t t December 2016 and going to January 2017, February and March where we gave briefings. And in those briefings, we um, 
we reported back what percentage of violations we face versus trucks going through the um, the facility, and and we also reported back on what goods were also having um, the most violations. And and I have some of that information in this presentation. But my point is, is we wanted to. Um, work with the community to, to let them know what the effects of, of the weight law would be on their business. Um, and it was also around March of 2017 that we decided to implement uh, a permit process for the law. And you could see part of the purpose of having a permit was um, it would allow, it would buy more time for the industry to figure out how to reduce their loads and get their business adjusted to the law. And so with the permits, uh, there were what? 90, 90 day permits that they can, days. yeah, there were 90 day permits that we can renew. Um, and with the permits, and you can see the table to the right, I know it's kind of hard to see, but it allowed um, increased weights for per various commodity for containers um, and um, and allowed those those businesses to to um, go heavier than the weight law per the commodity that they were hauling and you notice that some of the heaviest and these were based on a lot of the um, uh, analysis of the uh, site of the weight violations from the previous months and you could see that um, food stuff was <laughs> the ones that were very heavy. And you can see that we allowed for gross weight uh, 90,000 pounds for uh, food stuff, and, um, which is 10,000 pounds over the, the gross vehicle weight. So, so the purpose of this permit was to allow, um, to buy more time for, for industry to comply. Um, and also, in regards to um, the food stuff or, or any material, uh, we were trying to encourage um, a development of a transload facility or a divanning facility where containers, uh, container trucks could have some place to go to then break the seal and unpack and, and distribute it to a, a smaller load. Because part of the problems we have in Guam is the sealed containers are taken from the port directly to the consignee's location. And there's not an opportunity to unpack them or even break the seal. So it creates this difficulty with um, getting the weights down. Um, and also with the permit, if, if there is a desire to change the law, it, it gives time to make that decision. So, so just, uh, Mr. Nadeau, with regards to some of the items that you identified, allowed mm -hmm. the industry more time to gain compliance, so it was a singular 90-day permit that was granted? Uh, they can apply, they can reapply. They could reapply, yeah, that option yeah. was available to them. Yeah. And then the possibility of a transload facility, has mm -hmm. that materialized? No, go ahead. So, so Senator, uh, what, what the thinking was, was we're, we're now imposing the, the enforcement of the law, which hasn't been done. And, and um, I understand, again, no, from, from being in the industry that we live in an island and we want to pack as much as we can on the ship so we can reduce the cost of transportation. Um, and so we were trying to balance um, preserving our roads um, for now as we implement this, but not to, to have the cost of rice or the cost of spam or the cost of chicken to, to go sky high. So that's why we, 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 um, um, we're working with the industry and we're saying, okay, we'll, um, um, we'll give these permits, and, and my thinking was that, that uh, it'll take roughly about three years for, for somebody. It, um, I don't really think it's the responsibility of the government, but I thought it was an entrepreneurial opportunity for somebody to, and, and I'm hearing people are actually talking about it and maybe, maybe pursuing it, but it'll take three years for somebody to do a refrigerated uh, debanning uh, facility, and, and you know, I guess uh, make a little bit of money, but also um, serve the purpose of of packing the container or whatever uh, they have, bringing it to Guam and then debanding it, so that when we when we when we do go over the roadways, um, it'll go with the, the the weights that it's designed for. So, so Glenn, you're saying that on the container where it says the maximum amount of weight, 
They're exceeding that? Is that what you're saying? Yes. For, for what? For a container? Okay, you, you understand where I'm coming from, right? So, sorry, so on, on every container, it tells you what your max load you can put in the container. Yes. Correct? Now, when I look at your, your weight limits, it, it identifies the, the number of axles where your weight, you can carry more. You can carry a bigger container. Yeah, right, right there's the mic. Just press the mic, and then you can talk. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon, Senators. Okay. Uh, Paige Butler, DGX. Uh, Chairman for the Maritime Affairs Committee for the Guam Chamber of Commerce. Um, what you're saying is what is a maximum weight that you can put in a container that the container can hold, okay? That's what it's designed to carry. But with the road restriction weights, we cannot come even close to that amount. Because like you said, let's say it's 66,000 pounds. Okay, right now with the restrictions for the over-the-road weight, you know, we're lucky if we can get 40,000 pounds. So we're basically cutting the capacity down by 50% almost in that container. Or we can put 50% more volume weight-wise inside the container. Now, I'd also like to point out that, you know, what they're talking about as far as having this divanning center or transfer station, um, the cost is going to be extreme on that. Here's a guy right here to tell you how much concrete goes for, okay? And it's going to cost a fortune to build that. So to, ha to have to pay the additional cost to do the divanning, you may just, well, just lower your weight in your container and just ship more containers. But also, I want to point out, too, that Guam has some of the highest rated ocean charges coming to our island for transportation costs. That's why you have the wholesale distributors packing those containers high and tight because it's, it costs them one fee. So whatever they're not packing in, they're just paying for air space in there. So they're trying to get it all the way up there. Okay, and I'm not condoning the overweight that I've seen in some of their fines and penalties, which was very excessive. I mean, there needs to be a limit, but, you know, the, the restrictions that they're putting out with the new weight law, um, it kind of hurts the community and the wholesalers, especially with, you know, keeping their costs down for some of our primary consumables no, on the, island. The, the only reason I'm asking that is on, on slide number four or five, they talked about the maximum GVW... Gross vehicle weight is 80,000. Yes. Okay. Now that's everything. That's tractor, container, everything. chassis, driver, goods. <laughs> and goods. That's everything so, across the road. Includes so, the truck yeah. weight. So, <laughs> so you're saying then that it's actually about f half of that weight is the product? Yes. Okay, and I'd, we, I'd like to okay. take this opportunity to express about the, um, you know, when he was talking about the axle weight limits, you know, granted it, it says 34,000 pounds for tandem axles. So you got a standard ocean transportation, you got the tractors, got the two axles on the tractor and then the two axles that are on the trailer. Okay. So you would think theoretically, okay, I can go 64,000 pounds. So 34 times two. But when we introduce the bridge formula, for our standard equipment for the distance between our axles on the, the that's the furthest front axle on the tractor, not the drive, not the steering axle, but the drive axles, to the rear axle on the container, it jumps us down to like fifty thousand pounds. So you can never get close to sixty four thousand pounds on the tandem axle weight. So, so but what we've seen though, Senator, is that we've seen um, guys like uh, shoot, I can't even remember where they're at insert a, a, another axle and, and it distributes the weight even further so you can, you can get up to, as, as uh, Brady said, if you look at, <clears throat> if you look at the, the, the bridge formula, you can I'm go sure up to gonna, I'm sure we're going to uh, continue this conversation when we open up the, sure, sure. the, the floor. Let's, but you can let's go to complete the overall point. presentation first. And, and certainly your comments are, are very well noted in terms of contributing to the conversation. But let's complete this presentation okay. and then we'll open up for our stakeholders to comment. Okay, uh, can we get the presentation? And let's go to the next slide. So from uh, August of last year to the end of December of last year, uh, 98 citations were issued, and these were citations with the permit in place. So this included over the permit level, level and also um, without permits. Let's go to the next slide. And over that same period, um, 
we had uh, 527 trucks who were over the legal axle weight um, but met the permit axle. So what this means is if we didn't have the permit in place, we would have had 527 um, fines related to axle loading. Is there, is there uh, Mr. Nadal, is there a fee associated with the granting of the permit? No. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's $100. Yeah. So it's $100 for a three-month, 90-day yeah. uh, allowance to exceed at least within your restrictions. Okay. Thank you. And, but some of the permits were granted, uh, like I said, for the frozen goods, we allowed them for it, up to a year. Uh, while we're on this slide, I'd like to point out one factor is that if you look, the highest amount of violations was given out to refrigerated food stuff. It's consumables for, you know, people. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so based on your citations, uh, Mr. Director, these consumable liquids and, and some of the consumable goods, they did not necessarily, the trucks did not necessarily have a permit? They had so, permits, but they exceeded the permit weight. Yeah, these, these, are the, these are the weights over legal axle load, yeah, well, but they met the permit no, axle no, permit limit. Weight. We gave them a permit, and they exceeded the permit weight. No, th this, this, one, this one, it says they met the permit action. Oh, yes. no, they, no, no, they, no, they met the, the, I'm sorry, excuse me, sir. They met the permit limits, but they were over the legal limits. Sorry. So legally, the 34,000. So if they didn't have the permit, they we would, would have, have issued a, cit a citation. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, next slide. So this is just for a bit of perspective. Uh, for the month of December, we had around just under about, we had 4,888 trucks pass through the whim. Of those 4,888 trucks, 570 trucks were weighed. And um, of those 517 trucks that were waived, 25 citations were issued. Uh, there is a bit of a caveat. Um, there probably would have been more trucks weighed, but a certain amount of trucks ignore the call to come over to be weighed. So, um, so that 517 may be higher if, if everyone obeyed the law. <laughs> um, so is, is it a requirement that any truck that is leaving the port facility has to go through this test facility? Yeah, it's, it's, the whim is a way in motion. So you're going at your... Yeah. Uh, at the highway, I mean roadway speeds, and if you're overweight, there's a, a overhead um, um, notice that tells you to pull into the test facility. So that's what that's what you'll have to do. So in that case, when someone a trucker is flagged and they just continue to drive on, then, then they're in violation, yeah. and and it's the driver that we will go after. Yeah. Okay. Senator Adam. I, the one statistic that I don't see here, and I think you had it at one time when you first open up the tests was you started collecting data as to of, you know, the trucks coming out from the port, how many were actually over the weight limit, right? And I think you took that statistic, you, you took those statistics for over a year. Yes. And so I think it was something like 98% of the trucks that were going through were over the weight limit uh, at the beginning. Uh, I, could, I could clarify that. Okay. Um, so what that told you is, so you have the, all the trucks leaving the port facility, and they, all of them drive through the way in motion uh, weight. If you're overweight, you get flagged to go to the test facility. What the 98% was is all the trucks that were flagged to go to the test facility, about 98% of them were overweight, which means that the way in motion uh, system was working. <laughs> you know, it didn't, so it wasn't, it wasn't identifying trucks. Um, I understand, okay. but I think, the objective when you first opened up in 2016 was to get a gauge of how many of our trucks were getting on the road and were overweight. And so when it was initially started, it was a high percentage. At the end of the 12 months, it was still a high percentage. No, I, we're, we're, we're seeing it come down. Oh, you're seeing it come down yes. now. Yes. But for a while there, it was basically just kind of being ignored. Well, what we found in until you started, then until they came to that point where citations. Now it's no more a uh, hey guy, you're you you know you're overweight. It's hey guy, you're overweight, and by the way, here's the citation. Then that caught that started catching attention, right? Yes. Okay. 
Yeah, just, yeah, we, we did see the um, number of citations come down slightly until before we were finding people, but not significantly. And now that we're, people are going through with the permit, you know, it's still over the legal law in many ways. So, so I only bring that up because uh, the statistic about, you know, 98 citations were issued or, or whatever, it just kind of, I don't have a frame of reference as opposed to when you first opened up, the number of violations were here, and at 12 months later, the number of violations was just a little bit below that. No, no, it's, 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 it's low. Okay. Yeah, it has gone Dan, down. Chime in. Uh, so basically what it is is when they started collecting the data, basically the citations without the fines. Uh, it, the numbers have come down, but due to the fact because what we do, what I do now is, if you come over the, the static scale and you're over the legal limits but within your permit limit, I still collect that data so I can give the industry, this is your truck. You had the permit, you're good, but legally you're not. So I give that, that data work to the to industry so that they, they can try and figure out how to, to uh, disperse their load within the container. Um, if you're, yes, the citation might still be up uh, because industry, sometimes they want to do bang for their buck and fill it up to the permit limit, but that wasn't the goal for the permit limit. The, the goal for the permit limit was like two, two slides back. It's to get the industry within compliance, build that devanning station down at the port, or change the law. So that, now, that's... that's I can't tell industry, but I do tell them, your magic number is not the permit number. Your magic number should be the legal limit, which is 34,000 tandem. Because if the permit should go away, and if, the, if you're bringing in refrigerated goods in a 40-foot container, and we're giving it to you at 41, 41,000 on a tandem, the permits go away, then they're gonna be really struggling. How do I bring that weight down now to 34,000 pounds? but we're giving you this permit to do that now until they can change the law or build a devanning station. Vince, let me uh, open this up now because there's been several reference to the industry players and the impact that it's having right now at this point in time. So any comments from anyone at the table? Yes. One more thing, sir. Um, what, what we did was, you see, and, and Senator Adams is correct, we, we collected a, uh, uh, um, a series of data and what you're seeing here as, as, uh, as part of our uh, 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 increased weights and we permitted the weights, what we did was we divided the industry according to uh, the industries as you see and we said at 80% um, that's, that's where we put the marks, the, the cutoff point. And so that's, that, that was the rationale uh, and that was the thinking that and again we want to get at least 80% and so we, we can work uh, closely with the 20% that haven't and see what we could do to bring them down. And we've done a lot of, we've done a lot of work with them. And uh, You can ch jump on me later, but let me just say what we did, at least the good stuff that we did. So we, we, we worked with them a lot, and we're still working with a, a, lot, of the, with a lot of the truckers. Uh, um, we're seeing, um, you know, it's, it's a matter of how you pack, and, and, and if you put a lot of, if you pack towards the, the, the back of the container, which is not where, you, that's where the trucks are, uh, and so we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of movement and shifting and getting a lot of cooperation with the industry. So uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an impact because, because, again, we've never done this before or we haven't done this with any kind of consistent enforcement. And, and uh, um, you know, there are, there are solutions and, and we've, we've, thrown out, we've thrown out one, which is, you know, a devanning place. Uh, another solution we talked about was having a haul road and, and stuff like that. So there are other areas that, we, we, there, that, that can be looked at. Um, and we're, we're all, all also uh, proffering that, that we, um, um, it, one of the things that we're looking to eliminate is, is, is if we can, we, I'm okay to li eliminate the, the, the 80,000 pounds so long as we go on per axle weight and, and go on a per axle weight limit, which allows, um, if we like follow the bridge formula, it allows for 110,000 pounds if we allow for that. Um, I'm also wanting to ask the, the legislature to give me 
the flexibility because there's no, there's no wiggle room. 80,000 is the max. Um, you put an extra axle, you, 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 you know, you know, you, uh, and it's not really hurting the roads. Um, I'm saying, uh, uh, you know, I, I really don't have any issue with that. I, they should go on the road. It's not, it's not, it, it's not going to uh, damage the roads. Or, or, or so, so if we put in additional axles, then we, we, we should be good. I, I got different proposals from different people, and, and I'm not sure that I have the, 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 the ability to, to go higher on a, on a permanent basis. So, so I, that's what I'm saying we, 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 can, we can do in terms of um, um, options we, that we can look at. Um, and then, again, if, if, if somebody's, to me, uh, w what we did was we, we said we, the roadways have, have never been, uh, uh, um, what is it, uh, policed in, in terms of weight. And, and now we're, that we're doing it, we're, I'm, I'm asking for um, if it's like 5% off, and you know maybe we can sort of wave that off, and you know it, we're talking a couple hundred pounds, but anything above eighty thousand pounds, uh, according to the law, I don't have any 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 wiggle room to do that. It's just we're going to have to give you a citation. So, okay, thank you, Director Leongro. Jerry, please identify yourself for the record. Yeah, I'm Jerry Johnson, uh, President of Hawaiian Rock, and a member of the Guam Contractors Association. Um, getting back to what Paige uh, was talking about earlier. Um, you know, we understand the previous law that we were, we were designing our trucks for and everything was 20,000 pounds per axle and a maximum of 80,000 pounds. So when you, you ask what was enforced out on the roads, on the other roads beside the port, you know, our trucks were mostly within that limit. And, uh, and so the, this law was, the law that was passed uh, mirrors the, the law that the Federal Highway um, federal law requires for the interstate highways, the, the Eisenhower interstate highways, where you have thousands of trucks, thousands of bridges that are steel bridges, you know, all different, all different um, ages of bridges and everything, and it's to keep the, that amount of traffic and those heavy loads off of the interstate, uh, the interstate highways. Um, each individual state goes and um, passes their own laws based upon their conditions. Some roads have bridges, so they limit, limit the loads to, you know, something like the bridge formula, but, but um, there are alternate routes for certain vehicles to deliver their products, you know, not using the interstate highways. We don't have that here. This law applies to every single road on the island. I mean, I, that means for me to deliver a load of concrete to a village road that we have to go in on that road and deliver it to the homeowner and turn around and go out, the truck that I have to have is much longer, it has drop down axles on it, it has all these restrictions, it's impossible. It, and those trucks with those axles on them have a very difficult time turning corners at intersections. So, so it, it, in the law, there's first of all, it's a maximum of 60,000 pounds, so even if we added those axles on to it, I don't know if we'd, we'd meet the, you know, there's no, uh, nothing in the law to allow to go over 80,000 pounds. And, and those, those vehicles would be so long and have so many axles on them, um, the cost would go, the cost either goes up on those vehicles substantially, or like a typical ready-mix truck that can haul nine or 10 cubic yards can only hold 6,000, six, um, I'm sorry, nine or 10 tons can only hold like six tons, well, I'm sorry, six cubic yards. Of, and so it substantially increases the cost for the delivery of our concrete, our aggregate, all of that. Um, um, Eddie over here has done a lot of work on looking at all the laws around the country and how they're applied. And, and you do have a lot of flexibility in what you could put into the law without just copying the interstate um, highway system law. Um, we have, um, you know, I got a lot of comments about the roads. You know, there's a, I know you're concerned about the roads, but, you know, we've got a, a list that we'll, we'll pass out of, of how old the roads are or how long it's been since the roads on the island were, were resurfaced. And most of them, except for the recent projects, are over 15 years ago. And some of them as many as 30 years ago, the ones down south. And 
Um, the way we design our roads is, you know, you have a, the base asphalt is made out of our local limestone, and then, and then there's either a three-quarter inch in the old days, now a one-inch friction course on the, on the uh, surface of the road uh, for the skid resistance. And, and that, that, that additional inch on there, if we go back to the uh, National Asphalt Paving Association, we've got a lot, they've done a lot of research on this, and the, that friction course on the roads should be replaced every 10 years. That's what they recommend. And, and we're, you know, we're trying to make our roads last 15, 20, 30 years. That's why the, the roads start peeling with the asphalt. And the other issue is the intersections. You know, the, the intersections of the roads where there's heavy, where there's turning of a lot of traffic and everything. We did a good job in designing them to put concrete underneath them. So when you approach the intersections, the underlayment doesn't shift. But the surface that's put on there um, is uh, only one inch thick. And turning on that, with our environment being so hot and the, and the concrete only be under, all the intersections, even with the new uh, specifications we're required to, to follow, all the intersections are, are uh, failing, even with the new mixed designs. And um, there are solutions to that. On, and we, you know, we've been, we presented a lot of solutions, but none of them have been implemented. We're still putting out specifications following the FBO3 specifications, and there's no, and with the same old, and we're going to continue to, they're going to continue to spend money on the intersections, and, and they're going to continue to fail. So um, we, we've asked to have a, uh, a, uh, I know I'm getting off the subject here, but we've asked to have a special design that's suitable for Guam and makes sense for the roads on Guam. You know, there's things that we can add to the asphalt or do something like they did at the uh, Tijin Parkway intersection. It wasn't us, it was our competitor that did that where you make a flexible asphalt like is used in, in Japan. Um, and uh, it's working very well. It's, a, it's more expensive but it'll protect the intersection. Then you will get your 20 years plus service out of them, but you gotta spend more money on it. And so I don't think the vehicles on the roads are, I think the roads are actually holding up very well, some of these old roads, um, considering the length of time since they've, they've been servicing. I don't think that the trucks on the roads are do, doing severe damage to the roads or the you know, heavy vehicles. Yes, they do impact it, but I don't think it's as great as what they're, you know, they're requiring under this law. If we could limit it to the 20,000 pounds per axle like we had before, and I don't think we, we have a problem. And why do we need a bridge formula? I mean, yes, we've got bridges, but they're short span concrete bridges. The, now, the bridge formula does help us in what Glenn was talking about, to carry heavier loads because you put more axle in there, but that's, that they have to be permitted too. And if you're gonna not allow the permits going forward, then we're stuck with the 80,000 pounds, no matter how many axles you add. So there's a flaw in the law, you know, for that. We can't even, you know, we can't haul these heavy loads. Um, even if we buy longer trucks and more axles and everything, they have to be a special permit to, and and it doesn't. It's not allowed for in the law. I, I don't. I don't want to break an ice, but have you submitted anything to anybody so we can take a look at it, the legislature and make the amendment to the laws? Yeah. Well, yeah. We. Okay. No. The only reason I'm asking because I like what you're saying. Yeah. No. We have. We have. A, we have been working on a law, a revised law, for a year. And okay. Eddie Cruz here has no, done. No, all all, most all of I'm it. trying to get at, sir, is that I like what you're saying. I can agree with it, but if, if, if none of us are seeing it, it ain't going to go any further than other than we're talking. I, I understand what you're getting at. I can look at it, but I'm not going to look at it right now. But right. I'm just saying is that, and I've met Kathy on many occasions, that if, if we don't see the document early on, um, it's a nice conversation piece, but that's how it's well, possible. And I, I just want to express that. I, yeah. I like to change how we do our roads, because we see the roads a lot. I worked with Ben before. We see the problems out there with the trucks. And I want to get the product out to the, to the consumers at the least cost. Mm -hmm. 
but we got to make it work. And you're saying that you need to raise the limits? Have you put that proposal in yet? No. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to throw this at you. I'm saying, sir, that, that if, we, if we want to raise the limits, uh, we're going to have to look at how, what we're doing. Uh, if, if you're, to me, the real simple fix is, if, and they don't agree with this, but if you, if you adopt the, 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 the bridge formula, that allows me to go over 80,000. That my goal is to get over 80,000 pounds without affecting the road. Um, the other, the other, the other limit, the other proposal, other proposal is, is to, uh, and this is something we talked in at an item, which is, we, we develop a whole road from from Cabras to Harmon, and 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 then uh, and strengthen the road to go up to 110,000 pounds, right. and that's going to cost. And so what I'm asking for is, is that if if we're going to do that, um, it'll cost us what is it, 60 million? Yes, it's uh, for, from Cabras. Uh, we figured about six million per mile for uh, Route One. I have it in the presentation later on, and that that accounts for five or to seven lanes of replacing the pavement, so it can handle the heavy load. And, and there are other things that are happening too. The developments that are going on um, with DOD, and we're happy to share that as well. That should go into into our mix as we talk about if we want to do the whole road option. There's 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 it's not a uh, from from from. Um, uh, Naval Station to Harmon, that's $120 million. Okay. Uh, but but there, are, there are injects from, from DOD that we're going to get from them. They're going to fix um, the bridges, all except for maybe Atentano. Um, in Atentano, we have an issue. But all the other bridges, they'll, they'll strengthen uh, because they, they have heavier equipment in, in terms of armored, armored vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we're going we're gonna to build, and, and we're also going to uh, strengthen the the um, uh, manhole covers and the, and the, and the um, what do you call it, the, the flood, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, drainage, drainage system and also drainage systems. That's worth ta estimating, that's, but that's for their route, road, their haul road systems. So, so from, from, we're talking, um, um, if you want, I can explain it. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so, um, let's turn it down. Let's, let's listen to some of the other okay. industry okay. Uh, players in terms of their comments, to, and then we'll proceed. Yes. Um, to answer the senator's question, um, we started immediately after the law was passed to try and get um, all the stakeholders together and try and draft, you know, draft new legislation. Mr. Eddie Cruz over here researched, you know, tremendously all the states, all the laws. Everything we, you know, we met with, uh, you know, the uh, wholesalers and everybody to try and um, see what law would make sense for Guam, protect the loads, and I mean, protect the roads and and put together a law. So uh, we finally completed that at the end of last year, and and that's when we presented it to the Chamber of Commerce and the Contractors Association to present to uh, the senators. Um, we were told, Mr. Yeah, that is the. That is the product. Is that the law? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the product we looked at. We did forward it to, uh, to the uh, chairman here. He has a copy of it, and that's what we'd like to look at. Of course, there hasn't been any comments from DPW or, or Parsons on it, and, and I'm sure they have some concerns, but, but um, that's, what, that's what we're proposing on, on this situation. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Have you had an opportunity to be able to review the proposal? Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll hear from you in terms of additional comments from DPW. Any other industry players want to contribute to the conversation? Hey, Mr. Cruz? Quick, there you go. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just for the record, my name is Eddie Cruz. I've been actually on multiple commissions regarding the truck weight law since 1980 uh, when I returned from college, uh, especially with the direction of the the late Juan Limtiaco from Pacific Unlimited, or Pacific Trucking. Um, this last law that came in and was uh, passed, uh, we basically had little to no knowledge about it, even though there was a, a notice for a public hearing, and I'd asked both the Chamber GCA, and the first initial thing, because I was off island and didn't see the actual proposal, was that it didn't affect the wholesalers or commerce at all. My biggest problem is how it affects commerce because 
Um, in the United States, there's more ways to haul cargo than just one. We have everything coming on roadways, where in the mainland they have railways, they have waterways, and state roads, which are dedicated, much like haul roads, where they move their commerce uh, at a heavier weight. Going back to what you uh, were discussing about the, the roadways and the sharp turns and everything, if I did a lot of studies and met with a lot of people in this last year. I mean, so many that it just made my head spin. But the basic two things that help protect the roadways when it comes to, to um, oversized weights, what I mean by oversized is over what we have on the law books today, is that they need a lesser or greater radius so they don't scrub as much. That's been the number one issue. If you go to any of our intersections, you can see that top friction coat just peeling. Uh, it ripples, it, you know, and same thing with acceleration, deacceleration. When you have a shorter area, it tends to, or a steeper area even, it tends to cause more impact on the asphalt. Unfortunately, Guam has limited real estate, so like the tri-intersection, um, I drive a truck nearly every day, so I know which roads and, and what speeds I need to, you know, be, go safely through them, and that tri-intersection is really crazy. We charge at it to try and not hold up traffic, but then we break and we have to cut sharply. And uh, it's, it's just not a very good design. Unfortunately, because of the real estate and the gas stations there and the Tizen property on the side, we're limited. But anyway, going, ba going back to the law, what we did was we tried to find a compromise because everybody knows that there are maritime maximum gross weight standards. Those are totally different and much higher than what's allowed on the roadway. To tell an Asian supplier who's paying for the freight to Guam that you can't load more than so much is not, not a very good discussion. They'll argue with it. They'll tell you to get it to the port, and then it's up to you to figure out what you want to do. Unfortunately, we really don't have devanning, adequate devanning services at the port to break the loads down, put them in smaller trucks, and get them out of there. So that's the, the greatest thing. The, the other thing is what you guys were discussing with how to place your loads in a container. Everybody knows, and Matson has told me this numerous times, they're not going to invest in extra infrastructure, any trailers or anything, unless they're forced to. What is happening is we are getting container chassis that are the shortest possible so we can get them in these wholesaler locations. A lot of these wholesaler locations aren't adequate. Uh, I'll give you a prime example. Going into uh, where the old Goodyear was at in Tabuni across from Denny's, that sharp turn and that steep deal is crazy for containers. Second, second, there's a bunch of places that they can't use 40-foot containers because where they're unloading is up on the easement and having a longer trailer poses a, a danger to people transversing down that alleyway or roadway. So it goes back to put where if you tell a uh, supplier that he needs to put all the rice at the front of the trailer so when this truck goes down the road, it's shared by the truck and trailer, and then you disconnect. Guess what happens? As they unload the back, the trailer flips over forward. We've had that happen. What's the solution? Longer chassis? Goes back to, you know, the safety issue we discussed. Same thing with a lot of these wholesalers. Where they're at, you can't safely take the turn without interfering in uh, approaching traffic from the other lane or whatever. I'll give you a, a real good example. Have any of you turned into the Tumon driving range next to East West Rental where that pole is tight? We just had a garbage truck at an accident there uh, in the past months. And the roadways just aren't designed for, for these vehicles. If, if we wanted to compromise and do what Glenn said, have longer vehicles go down haul roads, we could, we could look at that. We could, uh, you know, I'm very receptive. Glenn and I, even though we're on opposite sides of the table, we're always looking for that solution and that common ground, that sweet spot that's not going to make uh, the average consumer, you know, basically not able to pay his power bill, water bill, or, 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 or buy medicine. So we, that's the, the, my biggest goal, is finding that area where it causes the least impact. So if you look at our proposal, I think it's, it's, it's a pretty good one. Glenn has agreed that if we go by axle weights, then 
it causes, uh, you, know, you know, each axle, if it's limited a certain amount of weight, the addition of extra axles gives it more potential to carry more weight, and we've agreed to that. So that's a good idea. The only thing I don't agree with Glenn is this bridge formula because it promotes the use of longer vehicles. We had a couple of engineers look at the bridges, an outside engineer, uh, independent, and we looked at uh, the evolution of how trucks evolved on Guam, where we got away from the big, long end dump trailers carrying aggregate and, uh, and larger stuff, and went to shorter vehicles because they, they were safer, or we determined they were safer, just on our safety records. So what happened was uh, you got these trucks now with four axle, five axle, but according to the current law, as, as, it is, as it sits now, these are basically illegal. They're, they're, they're more limited because you've got to reduce. Uh, you know, they're shorter, so the bridge formula comes into play, and then it's, it's not as productive. So what do we do? Do we force Hawaiian Rock, Cortec, and all these guys that have shaped their, their fleets, uh, you know, basically to be the most productive, to go back and reinvest in new equipment? It's, I don't think it's fair. I'd, I'd like to see like we did uh, back in 80. We gave a moratorium of 10 years. Said, here's uh, 10 years of useful life. After 10 years, go buy new trucks, you know. But it's, it's not fair to just change the law overnight and say, okay, from now on, this 20-foot container is going to pay $7,000 fine. If you look at the fines of the current law, they're really crazy. You look at the fines on our law, it's a little bit more flexible. It gets on that gray area and gives you the flexibility. Do I want to pay the fine or do I want to buy new equipment or break the loads down? So it gives you that choice. And I think, I think that's where the sweet spot is. You know, uh, I, I haven't seen any requirements that the Federal Highway uh, has put on us regarding funding, holding them hostage or not giving us money for our highway. I haven't seen any agreement with, between, uh, early on we heard it, there was an agreement between DPW the governor's office and Federal Highway that uh, they wanted a new law to protect the roads. I never saw that agreement. Um, but as far as everything else, I think that these people that are here now are very responsible. And everybody in the industry, starting with the truckers, the consumer, the wholesaler, the Matson, you know, all the shipping companies, we're all in this together. And we're, we're, we're trying to do something. So please look at our our proposal, and we're open to adjustments. Thank so, you. So, sir, within your proposal, you're asking that a moratorium so that what you have in the law can go into effect and then none of the industries will have a complaint. First, first thing is that's, that's partially correct. Okay. We need a moratorium on the fines. So we can continue to do like Glenn is doing and say we're going to keep examining the loads. We're going to get portable weight scales find out what the other half of the trucking industry is. Because we're only looking at containers from the port. We're not yes. looking at the aggregate and the other stuff. We kind of know what the concrete and aggregate is from Hawaiian Rock and these guys that actually scale their weights. But how about the average people that are hauling from a construction site in Tumon or, or Jonah or somewhere? There, there's no real way to, to, uh, to check that. So we kind of need a moratorium. So Glenn is not left holding the bag going to court because... He didn't uphold the law. That's my biggest worry. Right. The guy has been trying to hold the law. It's just that there's no wiggle room, like he said. So okay. we can have a moratorium and have continuous roundtables and come up with a Guam plan, which includes um, some kind of compromise and a better study of the roadways. My biggest problem with the roadways is the utility cuts. Everybody's seen those. Those are very bad on, on our roadways. That's a whole different subject. I'm sorry. <laughs> But anyway, okay, um, what I'd like to see is a roundtable discussion, find out exactly what is happening, which includes also a Guam formula for asphalt and roadways. Because obviously, if you look at the evolution of the roadways, we've, we've been doing studies for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And all the intersections are different. We've got concrete with basalt. We have concrete with an overlay. We've got concrete that's concrete only. And so... We need to figure out some standard for Guam that'll work, that'll work in the tight radiuses, uh, that'll, that'll work with braking on, on uh, intersections that are on a slope or downhill or uphill, and also take into 
uh, take into account the military loads going up. Every military haul road needs to be beefed up. And thank in fairness, you. they need to share the, the wealth, thank I mean, you, share Mr. the Bruce. money. I was under the impression that much of this conversation had been taking place over <laughs> the course of the last year, but I take it that there's still additional discussions that have to take place. Senator Tom, you had some questions or comments? Yeah. I, I, I'm going to spend about 30 seconds looking back, and then I think it would be more productive from that point to start taking a look at how we're going to uh, crack this nut. Uh, first of all, I, I just I, I need to say that to say that we didn't know about this new law. This bill, the existing law, was in an, in work in progress for about two years, and we would every time we would have a roundtable discussion, we would send out notices to the truckers. Nobody ever showed up, and then. A year later, after the bill was enacted, um, we, I, I, you know, I was approached that, hey, this is not workable. Okay, fine, show and then, so then please show where in the law what we need to change. And, and yes, um, I did receive something from, from you guys, and, and I, I came back and I said, please show me where you made the changes, otherwise, you know, I'm going to have to be comparing where to, I never heard back from you guys. Okay, we're here today. <laughs> so um, we uh, there's been a couple of meetings. There was a meeting at the lieutenant governor's office. The chairman wasn't invited. I had to inform DPW. I was invited. So you know, let's let's put our heads together and let's uh, let's get this thing done collaboratively. Thank you very much, Senator Ada. Uh, Senator, I want to recognize the President, Senator Nelson. Thank you, Senator, for joining us this afternoon. Okay, we're going to go ahead and proceed with your presentation, or I'm sorry, any other industry players uh, want to provide comments? Yes, you may. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, my name is uh, Trey Bowie, owner of General International. I'm a distributor wholesaler. I have a few points on the law that uh, passed. Uh, I import uh, products from uh, different countries, but uh, I want to mention specifically from California, which has a, one of the strictest roadways. Uh, the limit was 45,000 pounds of cargo. So when it came here, total gross weight was 68,000 pounds, and yet I still violate the law. So something wrong with the bridge formula here. It either is too restrictive. I want to say that uh, we all live here. We want to prolong the life of the road. We want to be a good citizen of the community. But uh, the law as it is written is so uh, strict. Uh, the second point I want to make is uh, to take away the violation of the driver after so many violations, which is not his fault. He's just drive. And yet, you know, if he's over the weight, he got taken away. I think that's too draconian. Uh, for business, after the third violation, business license will be suspended. First of all, I order the product, they load in California. I don't have much control. And if after the third violation, my business license is suspended, I think it's too draconian. So those are the points that I think to solicit uh, cooperation from the community, I think the law should be a little bit more humane and more reasonable. Thank you very much, Tree. That's one of the reasons why we're here, and, and we're discussing some of the issues that have been brought up over the course of the last year. Any additional comments from our stakeholders? I just wanted to make a point of clarification to something uh, Senator Ada was uh, discussing in um, regards to the percentage of vehicles that were coming out of the port overweight. You know, based on the December numbers that you put up on the board, it would have been basically 10 percent of what comes out of the port was uh, noted as uh, overweight. And, and then uh, also, I do believe, Ms. Senator Ada, that we did make some uh, strike changes in the law before it was uh, enacted. And one of the ones was, uh, you know, eliminating the bridge formula and then the axle weight. We wanted it increased from the 34,000 pounds listed in there. I believe it was either 36 or 38 is what we were asking for uh, before the law was enacted. That was the last uh, I saw for amendments that we had requested to be made on it. And then just my last uh, comment, uh, um, going along with others, people says, you know, the, the biggest uh, holdup for us truly in the, the current law is with the uh, bridge formula. That is, is very restrictive, uh, holding us back in weights. Okay. Thank you very much. Please identify yourself for the record. 
Senators, my name is Hermie Keha. I'm the general manager for Micronesian Brokers, Inc., an affiliate of the Johnson Guerrero Company. <clears throat> I, I, from the perspective of the wholesalers, and it seems like the wholesale business has been, been the talk of the town, talk of the island for the past few days, <clears throat> uh, particularly with the hearing last Monday. Um, I like to kind of give you, give everybody a perspective of what, how the, or, the original law would significantly impact the cost of goods coming into Guam. As, as uh, Paige mentioned earlier, <clears throat> number one, because of the Jones Act, we're faced with high ocean freight coming into Guam, right? And of course, it's not going to help. If, the, if this Bill 230 is passed, where wholesalers are asked to, I mean, the tax exemption uh, is repealed, uh, you can imagine what the cost of goods uh, will appear on the shelves. For us, what we've done as a company, and we knew, and we knew that if we didn't take any action, we would be faced with increased cost of goods of the selling of the price of the wholesale price to the hotels, the retailers, everybody else that buys goods from us, particularly like the frozen, the refrigerated goods. You saw that was the biggest violator. What we've done as a company is that because we load our goods in an area in, in Oakland, what's called a green zone, where it doesn't pass through the California highways, we can load as much as we can, but for, for, for our discussion purposes today, so we've gone up as high as 54,000 instead of the 45,000 pounds. So if we were to go back to the 45,000, that means you are going to remove from us about 19% of those goods that had been previously been loaded into our, our container. So. Total, for example, the ocean freight with insurance and everything, wharfage and all that, comes out to $10,000, right, for example. And that's not that far off. With a container that has a 44,000 load, payload, we're talking about the cost of the product per pound will be almost 23 cents, whereas when we're able to load it in the green zone at 54,000 pounds, we're looking at about 19 cents, right? So you can see it's about a 23% uh, savings here just by loading in the green zone. Now, when it comes into the port of Guam, that's where the problem is, right? So we, as a corporation, made the decision to lease a facility inside the port of Guam where we do our divanning if we have to, to, so that we can continue to bring the goods into the island at the, at the lowest cost. And yet, at the same time, we had to go and rent a space in the, in, inside the facility, inside the port, so that by the time it goes to the scale, we will be within uh, the allowable increased weights, right? Our problem is that when it comes to the 20 footers, that's always the problem. For some reason or another, with the way the, the, the chassis is, is latched onto the tractor, axles, tandem axles four and five, that's where we always fail. It's where the heaviest weight is. So you can imagine the tractor, right? I mean, the goods are spread across evenly, but with with transshipment, and then all of a sudden at that angle, all of a sudden all oh, more weight is pushed back to the axles four and five. The irony in this whole thing is that we're within the gross vehicle weight. It's the bridge formula where we fail, right? So what we as a group, we've been meeting constantly and we've been talking about, yes, we're ha we have to ask the senators to put a moratorium on this, on, on this, on the fines, and give us, give the committee time to, to revise the law, which will make business sense for Guam. 
I had been traveling to Puerto Rico a number of times, and I was, lo and behold, I was quite surprised to know that that they don't they have their own weight limitations, right? And it goes as high as 110,000 pounds, not 80,000 pounds, but 100, 110,000 pounds. Um, I've driven all over Puerto Rico from east to west, and that's 100 miles, north to south, 30 miles, and they don't have that many bridges. And the roads are, uh, are, are fine. Um, what I'm saying, I think, is that Guam should revisit this whole law and do what would make sense for, the, for, for our community. We pay so much already for the price of, of a, a product like, like rice. I'll give you an example. Right now, because of the, the weight limitations, right, we would have to sell a 50-pound rice, which would be right now be $22.75 wholesale with a markup of 50%. That brings it to $34. With the with the the original test law and reverting back to the thirty four thousand pounds that cost that fifty pound bag of rice would go from twenty two dollars and seventy five cents wholesale to twenty eight dollars and fifty one cents on the retail on the shelf it goes from thirty four dollars to forty three dollars so tell me. Do you want our people to suffer even more by paying for a 50-pound bag of rice because our law you know, was designed this way? So I'm pleading with the senators to please think of our people and what it costs to buy the consumables such as rice and anything else that we consume. Please give the community time to revisit this whole thing. I know Eddie Cruz and the rest of the community have been, they, 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 they've put together some proposals and we ask, we're sorry if Senator Addo, if, if uh, I know you talked about how we didn't come forward with all these opportunities for the hearings, you know, and you know, that's water under the bridge, no pun intended, but, but I'm glad that you are giving us this opportunity, this round table uh, op opportunity to share our own thoughts about this whole thing. I want to say that, I want to end this by saying we are very concerned about preserving our highways. And Director Glenn, yes, we are all on board. <laughs> Thank you for repaving our Machechi Highway. He knows that I've been, our, our road there, because that's been, I, I've, I've learned to drive uh, uh, on that Machechi Road with my eyes closed because I know where all the holes are. But it's beautiful, and I see that they've already marked the road, and it's, all, it's going to be prepared for striping. We support a law that will make sense for the business, for the island, and, and I, I, I want to end this by saying thank you very much for allowing us to come forward and share our thoughts and our insights. Thank you very much, Hermie. I appreciate you joining us this afternoon and providing your comments. Please identify yourself for the record and proceed. Yes, for the record, my name is uh, Michael Jr. Laguanya, uh, Environmental Safety and Health Officer for Parish Brothers. And basically, uh, we provide affordable and reasonable uh, pricing on concrete, basically to provide affordable homes to people, to provide uh, affordable concrete to our hotel industry, our schools, our military and recently we had to increase the prices because of the adjustments that we had to make in terms of bringing in our material from off island we have slag we have cement that comes in and the way that works is we have certain containers that can, that are designed to hold these materials and because of this law we have to reduce the amount of materials we carry. And when we reduce it, and it comes to us, now the, cons the, now the people who, are, who want to buy homes, the schools that need to be fixed, the hotels that want to be expanded, or the military that are, we're currently building, uh, they get affected. The, the prices go up, just like wholesale, you know, just like the chicken, the rice, and gas, gas prices. It's not just 
whole cells also fuel. It affects uh, building materials. So um, we have prepared um, a proposed amendment to the law. And if, uh, with all the same to everybody, we, we ask that, uh, yes, we, uh, if we could amend the law to make it work for everybody. So I have to say. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, let's proceed with the uh, continuation of the presentation and then we'll close out. One thing that's, that's very encouraging is not only Director Leon Girl being open to uh, discussions in regards to addressing or revisiting the legislation. Senator Tom Adda is here as the sponsor of that particular law, so thank you, Senator, because I think it's critical that we move forward together in this. And then also hearing from the industry knowing and understanding some of the challenges and understanding some of the numbers that are associated with the full implementation of the law as it stands today. And the intent is to work with DPW, uh, work with Federal Highway Administration, DPW primarily to continue to preserve our roads, Federal Highway because they invested two to three million dollars and we need to, to work with them in terms of any revisiting of this legislation so that in fact we don't have to pay back the two, three million dollars in addition to addressing some of the concerns that have been mentioned here. So, uh, Nidal, if I can ask you to proceed with the presentation. Okay, thank you, Senator. All good comments from, from you guys. Can we have the presentation again? Uh, okay, so the slide I was on was the amount of fines that were issued um, as of uh, December of last year. Uh, so what you see here is the first set of numbers are fines that were actually paid. And for the first violation, uh, $21,735 uh, have been paid. Um, for the second violation, uh, $8,240 have been paid. Um, and then the second number is the amount of uh, unpaid citations. So these are uh, fines that have been issued that have not been paid yet, and that's $180,825. And so if you add all the numbers together of paid and unpaid, you get the total amount of fines that have been issued uh, for the tests. Next slide. <laughs> yes, right, for <laughs> right, more expensive goods, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so the next slide. Uh, DPW um, has recently obtained portable scales, and we're going to deploy them around the island. Right now, we're looking at potential locations for deploying them, and once they're in place, uh, DPW will be able to issue citations from those portable scales, so that will expand um, uh, the ability to... to uh, um, impact other industries other than just the uh, containers out of the port. Next slide. So this is kind of what we have been talking about uh, uh, with with the industry, and these are kind of alternatives to the test law, and and these are just some of the ideas that we're thinking about. No cost solutions. What that means is. Um, it doesn't involve government money. Obviously, there's costs associated with uh, smaller containers and things like that. Um, so the first one under the no-cost solution is, is the one that um, the director has mentioned, which is uh, just remove the 80,000 gross vehicle weight from the law and just keep um, bridge formula and axle loading requirements. And so that gives you more flexibility. Obviously for shorter vehicles, like the 20 foot containers, that would actually reduce the gross vehicle load weight because bridge formula is very dependent on the length of the, of the truck and the number of axles. Um, and then the other, the other suggestion, which was made by the director, was you know give him uh, the ability to have like a five percent tolerance um, in enacting the law. So if if if, if uh, a vehicle comes in that's within the five percent tolerance, there is a latitude to not issue a fine. Um, now the solutions which would have associated costs. Um, we did look at the GCA proposal, and if you go to the next page, um, is, is basically 
a comparison of, of the current law with the GCA proposal. Um, you can see um, with their proposal, they have uh, more alternatives for gross vehicle weight depending on length of truck or, or type of truck. Um, but, th but the maximum one is the 110,000 pounds, which would um, be associated with the typical five axle tractor trailer, which is about 53 feet long. Um, and then the, the current test law is 80,000 pounds for gross vehicle weight. Um, and so that's, you know, so that's like about a 38% increase. Um, and then you look at the single axle, uh, 23,000 pounds versus uh, 20,000 pounds. Um, that's like a, about a 15% increase. Um, the 46,000 pounds for the proposed GSA law with, for the tandem versus 34,000, that's, that's a, a greater percentage. That's, um, that's like 35%. Um, and then you see the tritum, 66,000 pounds versus 42,000 pounds. The, the tritum is not defined in the Guam law, but federal law um, says 42,000 pounds for the tritum. And, and that's a significant amount. Um, and then they don't have the bridge formula, but the current test law has a bridge formula. So I've been kind of looking through various studies, and there was a, a study, and I forget which university it was, but they looked at pavement costs uh, versus weight, and this is based on axle weight. So I, what they did is they just studied, you know, the maintenance costs for a given roadway um, versus the trucks that were traveled on it. And what you can see that as the weight increases for axle weight, the impact to the pavement is not a straight linear impact, but it, it's more of a, um, you know, it, it's more logarithmic. And so you can see on the on the paper. Um, oh, next slide up there. Um, for eighty thousand uh, pounds, um, for you know, like a typical five axle uh, truck, which is, I believe, the 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 um, light blue or the aqua color. Audio. Can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah. Next slide. Thank you. Um, the pavement costs uh, since. And this is again impacts to the road. Um, you know, it's, again, it's an inexact calculation. It's it's more looking at various case studies. Um, but the cents per mile of impacts for trucks for eighty thousand pound truck is roughly maybe about eight to ten cents per mile. But as you move up to one hundred and ten thousand pounds, it, it, the curve starts flattening out, and it's. Um, you know, it looks like it's about 35 cents per, per mile impact. Um, again, this is, you know, may not be completely applicable to Guam, but it does sort of indicate that it's not a linear relationship and that the heavier you go, your costs go up um, exponentially or, or logarithmically. So, yeah, it's just maintenance costs. If you if you take the maintenance costs of the life of the road and how frequently you have to resurface, then they figure that into cents per mile. If you go to the next slide, next slide, please, um, is, is just some costs of either replacing the pavement or milling and overlay the pavement. Um, for, um, so essentially, uh, heavier trucks damages the roads at a faster rate. Um, we can argue how fast or, or not, but essentially to replace um, the pavement for a routed road um, is three to six million, and that depends on the amount of lanes. Like, for example, for Route 1 at five to seven lanes, that'd be about six million per mile to re replace the pavement. Now, um, to resurface, meaning re re uh, redo the friction course, uh, which you should do every you know, 10 years, but you should do it more frequently, is about a million dollars per mile. Um, and, and then, of course, you know, the, the, the poor pavement has impact to the trucks themselves because, you know, the, you have to replace, ax or replace suspensions and realign, too. Um, so next slide. 
how much does it actually cost to maintain Guam's roads? So Guam has approximately 165 miles of routed roads, um, and payment designs are essentially based on a 20-year design life. Um, and generally, a roadway maintenance program includes periodic milling and overlay to preserve its function. This usually occurs two to three times before it has to be replaced. Now, based on that, um, if you were to mill and overlay all of Guam's routed roads of 165 miles during a 20-year period, it would be about at $650 million. Um, and then the cost of reconstructing those same roads over 20 years would be at $510 million. So if you add that together, it's quite a high amount. And again, these numbers are, are somewhat um, estimates. Um, because a lot of Guam roads are in various levels of, of repair. Some will need to be replaced sooner than others and, and things like that. So, so again, these numbers are more just estimates, but just to give you kind of an order of magnitude. So I brought that up in terms of the GCA law because, you know, yes, they are heavier weights, but since the pavement is, is designed for a 20-year lifespan and kind of based on the 80,000 pounds when you incorporate the easels. Um, going heavier just means that the, the, the life of the payment will be shorter, which will have cost. Um, the other alternative is, is something that the director had mentioned earlier, is that to um, incorporate a haul road, basically for you know the government to invest in a haul road. and so. We kind of looked at some costs for that. Um, two alternatives, one is Cabras to Harmon, which is about 14 miles, or from the Navy base to Harmon, which is about 20 miles. And with the $6 million per mile, the Cabras to Harmon would be about 84 million. And, and this is Route 1, and this is to do all five or seven lanes. And the Navy base to Harmon, which is longer, would be about 120 million. Now, one interesting um, part of this is we are working with uh, the DOD right now to create um, haul road networks for their heavy military loading and we're scoping that right now and they're looking to fund not re um, they're looking to fund uh, hardening the utilities in the roads that they have to haul and the roads that were the routes that we're looking at are route one route three and route nine and and while looking at it, we came up with the idea that just strengthening the pavement would be the best way to preserve the, uh, the utilities that are underneath the roads. So we've been looking at various pavement sections um, and, to, and scoping um, to, to, uh, to create the haul road from the military. And we came up with roughly a construction cost of 50 to 60 million. Well, the difference is, is they only want to strengthen one lane in each direction. So, for example, on Route 1, it would only be the outside lane in each direction. And also, the DOD is looking at funding replacing um, or rehabbing the bridges on Route 1 to support military loading, which would then support the, the loading from the heavier GCA loads. So, so there is some investment from, from the military in... in um, hardening the roads, which then could support the idea of creating a haul route. So that's a possibility. Now again, the, the 84 million or the 120 million, that's without the DOD funding. So whatever the cost for the DOD funding ends up being, you could subtract that from it. So, um, so those are some of the alternatives we're kind of looking at. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. So. Thank you, Brady and uh, Director Leon Guerrero. Thank you very much for that presentation. I'd like to go back to your no-cost solution. And please, if I can hear from some of the industry players in regards to some of these ideas that have been proffered. The first one is to remove the 80,000 pounds gross vehicle weight requirement, but with a caveat to keep the bridge formula loading and axle loading requirements. Yes, Mike. Yes, Senator. Um, I'd like to respectfully uh, disagree with keeping the bridge formula for safety uh, reasons. Uh, if, you're, if you're an experienced driver, the longer the, tr uh, the way the bridge formula works is the longer the trailer, the more that you can carry based on the spacings between axle. That's not feasible for end dumps or, or even uh, tractors that, that 
are, are not coming from the port. Um, Mr. Eddie Cruz had to rescue Paris Brothers a couple of times because our trucks flipped because we had to put our floating axle down to just try to make that turn. And in doing so, it becomes a safety issue. So as a safety officer, I, 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 from a safety standpoint, I'd like to disagree with that because we don't want anybody getting crushed or, or killed because the truck flipped because we couldn't make that turn. And I, I see that we're, we're, we keep um, putting out numbers. It costs millions of dollars to make these roads and, and stuff like that, but we're missing the point. We're missing the point. What is not identified is what's actually causing our roads to deteriorate. What's actually causing our roads to damage. Nobody has answered that question here. We're throwing out numbers. We're throwing out ways to improve. That's fine. But the bottom line is what is causing our roads to be damaged. Utility cuts. Lack of maintenance. You compare the road from Port Authority. Let me give you an example. Port Authority. How many trucks come out of Port Authority a day? 300, 400, you know? So many times. That road is very smooth. Go to Wai Seng So and see that road. That is holes, potholes. We have environmental issues. We don't know if there's been uh, studies on, 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 on um, compacting. We don't know if the engineer uh, did his job by surveying the, the land and see if it's feasible to uh, environmental issues. These things are not taken into consideration and are overlooked and thus being banged to the trucking industry that the reason why the roads are broken is because it's overweight. Go to the road, the villages. How many tractor trailers go into a village? But yet you see the road is a lot worse than Port Authority. Port Authority's road is very smooth. And we got heavy trucks coming, loads coming up for years and years. But if you go to our villages, doesn't that make you think that it's not a weight problem? It's actually a road design problem. It's a utility cutting lack of maintenance, these are contributing factors that need to be considered into why our roads are actually damaged. If I was to get a 40-foot container and turn into Payless, we can make it. But if we go to the villages, the mom and pop stores, it's going to be a safety issue when you turn into these tight spaces that I, I don't know how, how they get it there, but that's kind of impossible for me. But uh, I would like to respectfully descend on that uh, keeping the bridge formula for safety reasons and for reasons that I've stated on record. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Director Leongoro, please, if I can get your response in regards to the continual application of the bridge from formula. Well, um, the bridge formula to me is, is what allows us to go um, up to, to a, a higher weight than 80,000. That was my objective. And, and, and um, the other objective is that it preserves the road by what we put on the axle weight on on the asphalt, and that's you know very general, very simple. Um, uh, as far as as far as um, what Mike is pointing out, um, um, well, let me just correct one thing: the 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 Cabras Highway was a recently redesigned and a strengthened road, and was designed in lieu of the military buildup. So it is it's a it's a it's a it's a beefier road, and and, and it was you know just recently. We recently uh, uh, completed, but having said that, we're not, we're not, we don't do this, right? We're just, but, but the point is that that um, I, I'm, I think that we can look at at a at, at a at a sweet spot as as as, as Ed's uh, could, uh, talking talking about. Uh, every time I've had these discussions with these guys, <laughs> we're not going to ignore that, right? This is safety officer. <laughs> We're going to take a 10-minute break and uh, hopefully decipher exactly what's going on. Thank you.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This uh, roundtable discussion with DPW as well as the stakeholders regarding the test law uh, reconvened. Uh, we were at, before we were interrupted with a uh, fire alarm system that went off, uh, we were at the one particular question with regards to possible no-cost solutions. Uh, DPW has uh, mentioned that the removal of the 80,000 pounds gross vehicle weight requirement could be a consideration, but keeping the bridge formula loading and axle loading requirements uh, would be part of that caveat. So, uh, Mr. Director, a question was posed to you in regards to the bridge formula and why that continues to be a proposed requirement that you, you are recommending it remain in law. So, so uh, and I'm not the, the, the engineer, and I'm going to defer to, to Brady to, to explain that, but from a, from a layman's standpoint, um, we do have bridges, and they are designed. Um, we have, in the, in the past, what we used was, what was it, um, what kind of bridges were they? They were, uh, uh, no, culvert. culverts. Covert bridges were you know, just um, uh, concrete boxes and stuff like that, and you, you, you instill. But we don't have, we're, we're not designing that anymore, and we have that throughout the, through, throughout the island. Uh, and, 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 uh, and that's what we're moving towards as we, as we change the complexion of our roadways. So th th that's, so to me, uh, and, and, and in our discussions, long discussions that we've had with, with, with industry, they, they pointed out and correctly pointed out that there aren't any bridges on the northern side of the island. So, you know, the ridge formula really doesn't or shouldn't apply. I totally agree with that. Um, but uh, uh, what I need is, is, and what I'm concerned about is, is uh, and I think they are too, is that, that whatever weight we put on, the axle weight that we put on, it preserves the road for what it's designed for. So that's one thing. The other thing is, is um, uh, as, I, as I pointed out during the break, was, was that uh, I've always, uh, um, um, in our meetings, I said, I don't have a problem with us going with heavier weights, but, but if you're going to do something uh, significant to that, then give me the ability to, to strengthen the roads. And, and, and it, again, here we gave you $120 million for five lanes going both ways. But if we stay with the law, like you said, where they have to stay on the outside lanes, um, then, then we can strengthen that. That cost should be, should be reduced significantly. We're already getting money from, from DOD. And so the, the impact, it, it's gonna, there's going to be an impact. I'm going to need money to do that to strengthen the roads, but, but, but it's not going to be $120 million. And then, and then uh, the, 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 the third item that I wanted to share with my... my <laughs> <laughs> My thought escapes me, sir. So, um, oh, I can't remember. I'll... No, no, it wasn't. We okay, were... based on the uh, explanation to some of our industry players, do you have any comments? Because the director just just uh, reinforced the idea of keeping keeping the bridge formula applied here on island. Yes, Mr. Cruz. Yeah, part of early going uh, last year, we had a, a couple of engineers take a look at the bridges, and one of them even gave us a a letter uh, sig signifying that 85,000 for a straight truck within a short area wasn't a problem uh, based on the engineering uh, design. So that's one of the reasons why we weren't too concerned with the newer bridges. And we wrote into the proposed law saying that gives the latitude to the director of public works to all these bridges or any of these roadways that he deems insufficient to be able to put a weight limit on it. So that would take care of that portion. If, he, if you know, we, we redesign basically the roadway and strengthen it going to La Zone based on the, the garbage trucks going up there. We, Glenn still had to give them a, a, a waiver or uh, a permit to increase their weight. We still see deterioration there. So now we're looking at, okay, was there a design flaw there? Do we have uh, water issue that's saturating the, the base below it, or, or what is it? What is causing that? And so that's one of the reasons why we really need more time. We need to study the designs, because what the engineers are telling us, I went to Vegas last year, and they told me the same thing. It says, you guys don't really have bridges. You know, you got these short spans. It says, the bridge formula may have impact, but then again, it may not have impact. I was the guy that took the the rubble from a Ganyan bridge, um, I looked at that, 
and, and as a civil engineer, I couldn't find too much problem with that. Um, the bridge that Glenn was talking about going into Gorko, um, my dad and I had hauled 200 ton loads in there. And the only time we ever saw a problem with that bridge was a, a couple floodings and then the big great earthquake. With the great, big great earthquake, I don't know if Glenn has that documented, it dropped on one side. Hawaiian Rock knows that. Uh, the guys that, that hauled petroleum in and out of there knew that. And that was a big concern. So we, we kind of got to look at the whole big picture. Now, I was looking at the slides that the gentleman over there presented, and he's looking at the cost of the study per mile. Um, my, part of my discussion with engineers is the impact of different speeds. Guam doesn't, we don't do 65 mile an hour on the highway. So, so that, that numbers that he's putting out may be a little bit askew, but, he's, but it's a good basis to start with. So, like Glenn said, we need to figure out what do we need. My biggest problem with what they were talking about, the Hall Road, with the most outermost lane is we, we still have a problem with real estate. We still got power poles that are right up against it. I've hauled bulldozers that I couldn't use that lane because it would knock the poles down. Uh, we had one at ITC many years ago that got cut. Um, additionally, you've got your drainages on that lane. If you look at the majority of uh, Route 1 in front of Agania, because we have a sand base in there, you see a little bit of a, a dipping. The, the, the lane is, is not quite as even. No, it wasn't designed like that. It wasn't designed like Kmart where you got these big, huge ruts. You know, those, those are areas where the, 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 the underlay, the, the material underneath has, has moved. It's just part of nature. As the tides come in and out, as, as water la moves laterally, like fresh water, those things affect those things. So we need to, to be able to go back and study. And in areas, like Glenn said, in the north, we don't have bridges. We don't have the flooding problems we do in the south. The areas like Polaris Point or whatever that do have flooding problems, you can see pavement movement there. So those are things we need to consider. And I think Glenn, there's no man better for this job because he, he has turned every stone to see what we can do, how we can meet this thing. I think that uh, the major issue, you know, and I'll take all the blame for it. Uh, Senator Tom Adda said that we didn't show up, we didn't do this. Well, part of it was my fault. I was off island, I'm sorry. I don't read the paper every day. You know, we got two papers now, so I don't read all the notices. But the, the issue is we're here at this point now. We've been talking about this for over a year. Uh, we've come up with many solutions. Um, we still need more data. I appreciate the data coming out of the port, but I'm very interested to see what the data is that these gentlemen have when it starts coming out of different other locations. You know, going into the zone. Let's see what a trash truck is. I know those trash trucks are heavy, and some of them are only single axle. So, you know, we haven't been looking at that 26,000 and below trucks. Those things are, are, are often overloaded also, so that causes a little bit of an issue. So I think as we evolve forward and we come up with more data, we continue this discussion, which is very healthy, develop a Guam formula for asphalt, um, get together with the military, and maybe move that haul road to that center of the three lanes going each direction so it's more stable the cars can maneuver around us without causing any traffic or safety issues maybe even look at uh, one thing that people haven't really said upon and I, I really need to touch on it is more important than axle weight is the actual impact of the actual tire per square inch on the asphalt so we need to look at that also. That's one of the criteria for this whole program. And if it doesn't matter if you know, you're allowed a certain axle deal, if it, the tire exceeds so much per square inch on the asphalt, there's a violation. So that, that, that goes to you know, going back, as soon as they get more technical as they, they inspect these trucks, they're gonna look at what size tires you got, you know? Are they inflated properly so they carry the weight evenly? You know, all those things take into account. Even the uneven pavement, as the load shifts from one inside tire to an outside tire, that affects the pavement because then it becomes an overloaded tire. So as we go along, these are things we need to consider. But I think we're on the right track. So thank you, everybody, for all your comments, and we appreciate it. Thank you, Ed. Jerry, you have some comments? Yeah, I, I, uh, Glenn brought up a very good point. You know, um, there's no bridges in the north part of the island. 
all of the, and for speaking for the construction industry, all of the ready mix companies, all of the quarries um, are in the northern part of the island. Um, all of the, most of the big construction projects that are coming up in the future are in the northern part of the island. The biggest population on the island is in the northern part of the island. So the, the bridge formula really doesn't make sense for the northern part of the island. May, the weight formula and accurate, you know, the total weight and axle loads is what makes more sense. So if we do a new law, if we can, maybe we have to have it by zones or, or something like that. Maybe when we go down south over some of the old bridges, you know, you got to have different di haul lighter loads or whatever. But when, with all of this construction coming up in the north, and if you require us to meet the bridge formula, it's going to really increase the costs of construction. Thank you very much, Jerry. Yeah. We're going to conclude our, our conversation here, but I'd like to, uh, first of all, Senators, any questions or comments? Senator Nelson? Senator Adda? Well, I, I think um, one of the things that has been asked is uh, a moratorium on the um, assessment of penalties um, until more time, you know, to, to get more time, I guess, to to see where that sweet spot is. Um, uh, but if, if there's going to be a moratorium, you know, on the assessment of fines, I mean, I think data should continue to be, um, to be, um, to be collected. And, um, you know, the question is, is how, how much time are we going to need to find that compromise? I mean, I, I was looking at some of the things here. For example, the, the proposed increase in the weights um, uh, for, you know, as opposed to what the current law is, like for an axle, a tritum axle, I guess, uh, the Contractors Association is asking to basically exceed the current limit of 42,000 pounds by 57%. Um, you know, for a tandem axle to 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 basically increase it by forty five percent, and I, I don't know. I I have to look at DPW. I mean, is 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 thirty four thousand pounds under the current test law uh, basically the ceiling, or is there really just is there a little bit more wiggle room there? Uh, but, you know, to go 45% over the current limit, I, I don't know. I think we're going to have to, from, a, from a, an engineering standpoint, just study that. And again, my, 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 my uh, proposal is that if you want to increase it, all I'm, and I said it, and I'm repeating it again and again, and I'll, and I'll be a broken record, sir, but if you want to increase the weights, give me the ability to to strengthen the roads. And if you're saying, uh, you know, I was talking outside lane, uh, Ed is now saying outside lane is not sufficient. So if you go outside and middle lane, then you're in, obviously, if we do that, you're increasing your costs. And so we can come back to you and give you a cost estimate, what it will cost us to do that. But the, the, the problem with that is, is that, that because um, the, the loss is 10,000 pounds. My buses are 10,000 pounds. I can't, you know, we tell them they can't, they can't even go in the, in the middle lane because if, if it does break down, the kids get out and they're in the middle. We're, so, you know, we, the, the law's got to be simple and it's got to be straightforward so it applies to everybody. And so that's, that's, that's what I'm saying. I think to make it... Yeah, yeah, and that's what we're doing. We're doing that with, uh, with DOD now. But, but anyways, my point is that we'll, we'll, we'll get back to you on this. And, and what I did have a brain fart on, Ed actually did touch... And Jer, Jer uh, uh, also mentioned, and I think that holistically, what we need to do is not just look at the weights to see how long we preserve the road, but come up with the road specifications that that, that is germane to Guam, and 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 uh, uh, it's not the not something that that is um, a, a generic uh, formula for 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 uh, asphalting or, or road building, and 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 when we do that, then that's that's our law, and that's what we'd have to adhere to. 
Thank you, Director Younger. Senator Adda, are you done with your statements? Senator Nelson, yes. I, I just wanted to um, reiterate what Senator Adda said is, is the timeline is essential, no, because uh, we're going to propose a moratorium on these fees, and um, we have the wholesalers saying that the costs are going to go up for the entire island, and Senator Adda said this is 57% more weight, and uh, the good director of DPW says, well, what road specifications are we going to have, and how are we going to meet that? And you said that we've been discussing it for a year. So really, what is the timeline on this? Uh, how, how long are we going to wait for the data, and, and, and when, when is the right time? Because I think that instead of proposing a moratorium right away, we need to find the data to justify the moratorium. Uh, uh, Senator, we, for, for the Hall Road from here, we have the data. We're, we're, we're to, to act. The, pro the problem is we don't have the money. We don't have the resources. And, 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 and just to, to clarify, what, what, what Hermie said is, is accurate for, for, his, for his business. Again, what we did was for, for the wholesale business or for uh, dry goods, we looked at it and we, we demarcated 80%. So 80% of all the, the, the dry goods that are traversing um, on um, uh, Carabas Highway it is, is uh, um, they're okay uh, if they're permitted. Um, but his, t you know, I mean, his, some of them are, hey, you're good. Or, I don't remember, I don't remember, I don't call it out, recall out. Oh, okay. but, but, yeah, so, so. So he's breaking the law? <laughs> no, no, he gets cited, but, but and that's why they're asking for the moratorium. But the point, the point I'm saying is that, that we've already increased it, and if, and, and, and if, if Hermie's saying that uh, it's going to go up even higher, then, then that's news to me. What I, again, tried to do, this law was enacted a couple of years ago. I tried to mitigate it so the impact to the community is not hard. And, and, and even, even at that, even when I said, we turned on the switch and said, okay, no more moratorium, we're, we're, we're going live. If, if you had the, your first infraction, I waived it. If you asked me for it, I waived it. And, and because, because there are still people, even though you know, we reached out for two years uh, or a year and a half, we reached out. There are people today that come to me and they say, I've never heard of the law. And I'm like, okay. But so, so to, 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 to not, you know, uh, 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 adversely affect commerce, I waived the, the, the first violation, now you don't. And so it, it, it happens again, and so be it, we're, we're applying the law. Do you think that the 57% increase in weight is, uh, is comparable, is, is, is a good compromise, or do you think it's a bit much of what we're asking for? No, we're gonna, what I'm saying, Senator, is that if you want to go to the 50% increase, then give me the ability, give me the time to, to, to strengthen the road. And, and not just time, but give me the resources to do it. And, and, and I can, we can come back to you within a month, right, um, for the, the sure. two outer lanes, and uh, outer and middle lane. Uh, and, and give you a cost for that. And, and then and also subtract, it, it, again, we're, we're still in negotiations with uh, DOD. Because um, at the end of the day, they're, they're a part of the community as, as well as the way I see it. So they have to, and they, and they understand, they belly up to the bar and they're, they're willing to, 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 to pay their share. So they're, as I mentioned earlier, before you came, um, they're looking at, at building, strengthening some of our bridges all along Marine Corps Drive. And, and they're looking at strengthening what he calls the strengthening of the roads, which is the, the manholes and yes, yes, yes. so all of that. So, so we can put that into the mix and then come up with what, what, is, what is the bottom line that, the, that, that, that Guam has to play, the community outside of DOD. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Nelson. Jerry? <clears throat> yeah, I just want to just wanna mention, you know, so the we have a few um, overweight violations, and uh, mostly on the, uh, the asphalt oil. This material is coming all the way from Belgium, is where it's coming from. And um, of course, they loaded it at a port in Belgium, so, so um, it's, it's the amount that they put in these containers or what the containers are designed for. So um, as soon as we started working with Glenn, we, uh, we tried to uh, look at what equipment we needed to meet the law and haul, haul that over the, uh, the uh, roadways um, because 
it would have cost a, much more to to reduce the weight on those on those um, containers. And so it's taking us time to bring in that equipment, big expense and time to get in. And so we need some more and moratorium time and to uh, bring to get the right equipment in so we can haul these higher um, loads. And we have to increase the weight over the 80,000 pounds. Um, ready mix trucks. There are, we can buy trucks, new trucks, um, that'll meet the weight, the bridge formula. But again, they're much longer and much more expensive than anything. But we, our company will probably do that when we, when we, we can afford to buy our newer trucks. We'll, we'll have these trucks that are similar to the trucks they have in California. But it takes time to get all that equipment. And it takes, it, like he does, he needs a budget. I also need a budget, you know, from, from my parent company to be able to, to buy this more expensive equipment. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, we're going to go around the table for any final comments. The senators are done. Hermy, any final statements? Tree? Uh, I have an example in front of me here. I have cargo of 43,000 pounds, and I violate the law here. This cargo comes from California, and because of the bridge formula. So if you were to give me more weight limit, but the bridge formula in place, I cannot use it. So the, the, the hindrance is the bridge formula. So increase the limit without relaxing the bridge formula, there's just no good. I'm trying to say. Thank you, Tree. Thank you. Appreciate that comment. Vince? I'm sorry, I might be speaking out of turn here, sir, but if we are going to do a moratorium, uh, what does that do with our roadways if we say, okay, no more test permits, or, you know, we're going to do away with the law for now? Because right now, the way I'm understanding, the roads are built to this, the way the bridge form is. Or the bridges. Or, or the bridges. So I'm all for it. I'm, I'm with the director. If, we, if GCA wants to increase the, the, the max load and, and all that, with the director, like the director said, give us the resources, give us that funding so we can do it. But in the meantime, for that moratorium, what are we going to do? How do we enforce this law if we're going to do the more time? That, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Vince. Uh, I don't think there's been any definitive decision about uh, applying a moratorium with the fees. So we'll just suspend any discussion of that, at, the, at least at this point in time. I'll come back to you, Brady, and then we'll close out with the director. Ed, any final comments? Yeah, just a qu couple quick comments. As far as t uh, Senator uh, Talina Nelson was talking about, um, I think she's misconstruing part of the deal because the impact basically is is what touches the roadway uh, that that causes the major impact so in other words if you have a smaller tire it's going to cause more impact if it has the same amount of weight on it than a larger tire so when we're talking about increasing the gross weight we're also allowing it only if it meets a larger tire specification so that 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 mitigates part of that uh, the second part I would ask the senators is that this thing about talk about a moratorium. I think the biggest issue here is right now is loads coming out of the port going to Harmon Field or up to Anderson. So maybe creating a moratorium that gives Glenn some flexibility on that particular section for right now would be the less create the less impact on the on the consumers of Guam. Um, now that they're getting portable scales, we can study the other side of it, and we could try to get them to comply just as we were doing the containers. Say, hey, you guys, you guys have three axle dump trucks, um, drop your weight. You know, we've been doing that, and I think that's something that's not unfair to ask because many of those people don't know what they're carrying, don't even know what a bridge formula is. A lot of these drivers, if you, if you guys did a study and went out and, and asked every driver how to read the bridge formula, I bet you 90% of them fail. So the same thing with the, with the problem of, of, of uh, the fines, uh, directing it upon the driver like the gentleman at the end discussed. If he doesn't understand what he's doing or how he's loading it or if he doesn't even load it, how would it be fair to let him pay the fine? And how would it be fair if somebody else is unloading it somewhere else based on a separate standard like the California standard, why would it be fair to shut his business down after the third violation. I don't think it's fair. We need to relook at that. 
So I think some of those things, the fine portion has to be looked at, but give Glenn the, the flexibility to create some kind of a moratorium on some of the aspects that's got a big impact. But yet, let's study the other part of the equation. Let's study the, the military impact. Let's, let's study more of the cost. Give him a couple months' time or whatever he needs to come up with those numbers for the Hall Road. And that's all I'm asking is just be fair. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Mike, any final comments? Paige? I'd just like to mention that if we uh, go with the moratorium that we really need a drop-dead date of full implementation to give us time to get the proper assets on the island to be able to meet whatever the law is going to be. Um, you know, granted it's been two years, but we've been extending it in a sense with different ways, you know, the soft opening, the break in, then uh, now being able to issue, you know, 30 day or sorry, 90 day permits. And, you know, how long will that continue on? Because once it's going to stop, then everybody's going to need to get the proper equipment. Because right now, I don't think everybody is out there gaining assets to meet the current law because we're allowed to nudge a little bit with the, the permitting process. So that would be my only concern is, you know, you, you, once we do make a determination, give us that drop dead date, and it's got to give us enough time, you know, like maybe you know, six months to a year to be able to acquire these assets and also make adjustments. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. Unless uh, Senator Adder would like to introduce a, a measure with regards to moratorium, what I, the way I'd like to proceed with this entire process is to continue the conversation, come up with whatever the middle ground would be, it would be protecting the, the roadways uh, for a definitive or somewhat definitive timeline where there's 20 year life, life span of the roadways or 25 years, but then also coming to a middle ground with some of the weight restrictions. So I'd like to see us proceed with this process. Otherwise, the moratorium is implemented and then guess what? The discussion ends. Uh, and I think it's always best if DPW, after investing two to three million dollars of federal highway funds on a facility that we at least continue to generate the information of, of the weight that is uh, of many of these trucks that are going on Guam's roadways, and then we find a way to continue to uh, protect our roads to a great extent. Jerry, any final comments? No. Not Brady. Yeah, all I want to say is is um, is that the the payment is designed for um, a certain design life and. As you go over uh, certain amounts of weight, that its rate of degradation happens more asymptotically. It's not a straight line. So, so just to reiterate, uh, the director's point is: if we go heavier, we'll just have to have more maintenance budget. So. Thank you, Brady. <laughs> Director Leongo? I just want to say again, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman and Senator Ada, Senator Nelson, uh, and the trucking com community. I, we've, the other meetings I've had, they, they throw stuff at me. <laughs> and this, is, this, is, this, is, this is a little more civil. So. But, but at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I, yeah, again, we're seeing that there is a um, um, uh, a concurrence on on goals, and which is, we we want to keep commodities and, and commerce at, at, at the the lowest possible cost, but we also want to preserve our assets, which is the roads. And and I want to say thank you, uh, and I think that's if we continue to 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 think and 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 and, and work in in this direction, I think um, we'll come up with something that makes sense. I mean, it took me a year and a half to to get to this point, but. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so thank you. Thank uh, you very much, uh, Director Leon Gro. Just a couple of comments in closing. Uh, I think we've already stressed the importance of continuing to preserve our roadways as much as we possibly can, and we recognize that weight restrictions is a process that could possibly assist in that. Secondly, uh, I think you hit the nail on the head, Director Leon Gro and Hermie, when you emphasize the cost to consumers. At the end of the day, we want to preserve our roads, but we don't want to see prices for many of these commodities and consumable goods increase as a result of some of our decisions here. So, so we certainly want to take that into consideration. 
couple of, of recommendations. One was uh, proffered by the director, removing the $80,000 weight, uh, weight limit, vehicle gross weight, vehicle weight limit. That's one component. And I did mention about uh, retaining the bridge formula. On the other hand, there's a lot of concern from our stakeholders out there in the community, the truck drivers and the truck companies, that the bridge formula is really the issue. So that's, that's where I think we need to continue this dialogue. Another suggestion was uh, staying with a weight formula, uh, a weight restriction, and then anything in excess of that particular weight restriction, there would be, have to be a fee assessment. Let's say, for example, a truck is authorized to, to get on our Guam Road weights with 40,000 pounds. And then if anything in excess of 40,000 pounds to a particular limit, then that truck can, for each uh, truck, will be assessed anywhere from 200 to 300 dollars per uh, container, and then in anything in excess of a maximum weight limit, then penalties would be assessed. So, I mean, those are some of the suggestions that that have been proffered. The board does have a penalty yeah. Payment. yeah, but the, the penalty would be much stiffer than than an outright allowance cost to be able to take a a container off the, the Port Authority. So those are, are some of the, the ideas that have been shared, and I certainly hope that within the next couple of weeks we'll be able to put a little additional thought into some of the discussion t today. Uh, Mr. Director, if I can ask you on a deliverable, if I know you provided a comparison of the Guam Contractors Association, if you can take a look at their proposed legislation and give us your thoughts in terms of uh, their changes, the individualized changes, in addition to what you provided today, because you already provided some comments and the comparison assessment and what the implications would be if, in fact, the proposal that was proffered by Guam Contractors Association uh, were possibly considered and adopted. Okay, if there are no final comments, again, thank you very much, uh, Director Leon Guerrero. Brady, thank you, and to all the stakeholders, our truck owners, uh, truck companies, thank you for participating in today's roundtable discussion. We will have to continue this conversation within the next two to three weeks so that at least the dialogue continues and then uh, hopefully within a reasonable time frame we'll be able to find uh, a middle ground in terms of, of addressing some of the concerns that we discussed today. So thank you again, and please everyone have a good day.